Hey, hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Scott Luton and Billy Ray Taylor with you here on Supply Chain. Now, welcome to today's live stream. Billy, how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful, Scott. How about yourself? Uh, doing wonderful. We've done our weather check this morning in the green room. We had a great, uh, great session there. Everybody's eased into uh, cooler spring temps for the most part. I know Houston down there where you are, Billy, it's, it's getting a little bit warm today, but it's still a beautiful day, especially in global supply chain. Am I right? Absolutely. It, it is getting hot in here, as they say down here. <laughs> but in the green room, we had a great discussion, some game-changing discussions. That's right. So I'm excited, Scott, about today. I am too, my friend. So, hey, great show teed up today as we're talking about. We're diving into the big opportunities that exist when it comes to truly optimizing your logistics operations. Billy, we're going to be diving into how to capture and utilize data effectively and successfully, how to lower transportation costs, no matter what kind of market we're in. Those critical steps to implementing change, change that sticks, and a whole bunch more. Should be a great show, huh? Absolutely. I kept hearing innovation, innovation, innovation. <laughs> it's the way they do business. It was exciting. So I'm looking yeah. forward to it. I am too, my friend. All right. So folks, two last reminders before we get started here. First, hey, let us know what you think. Share your comments throughout this live discussion. We've got them right there in the chat box. We'll be sharing them throughout the uh, the hour live event. And of course, if you enjoy today's show, be sure to find it. Uh, be sure to share it rather with a friend or your network. Billy, they'll be glad you did, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's going to be key takeaways today. I'll tell you what to put in their portfolio of how to move their business forward. So I'm looking forward to it. All right, man. Well, with no further ado, then I want to get to work. We're going to wait, be welcoming in our featured guests here today, uh, starting with Chris Kapilis, Vice President of Sales Managed Logistics with Blue Grace Logistics, and colleague Carly Bly, Senior Director of Carrier Relations, also at Blue Grace. Welcome in. Hey, hey, Chris, how you doing? I'm doing well, Scott. Thanks for having us. You bet. Great to see you. And Carly, wonderful to see you as well. How you doing? Great. How are you? Wonderful, wonderful. We are just about coast to coast here today. We've got the uh, the uh, United States Supply Chain Market Corner, don't we, Billy? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get into all a great conversation here, uh, I want to pose a fun warm-up question to Chris, Carly, and Billy, and maybe even uh, folks like Michelle from Naples, Florida. Hey, this question's for y'all too, so y'all chime in. Great to have y'all here today. All right, so today, folks, is National Eggs Benefit uh, Benedict Day here in the States. How about that? So <laughs> now most folks may know it's a poached egg or eggs, Canadian bacon, all on an English muffin with hollandaise sauce on top. Man, it makes me hungry. So get this. Its origin story varies based on who you talk to. Some tie it back to a Pope Benedict way back in the 18th century. Others tie it back to a Wall Street broker named Lumel Benedict, who was searching simply for a cure for a hangover. How about that? So nevertheless, Chris, Carly, and Billy, whether it's Eggs Benedict or some other dish, where is your go-to breakfast joint for really good grub? And Chris, let's start with you. It's got to be uh, eggs and things here in Thousand Oaks, California. Uh, great food, great service. It's, it's the spot to go. Okay, eggs and things in Thousand Oaks, California. Okay, it's a great start. Carly, how about you? Yeah, so locally here, there's a little place called The Biscuit. It's a little, little spot, little joint, um, often a wait to go, but food and service are top notch. Okay. Eggs Benedict there is phenomenal. Okay, eggs and things, the biscuit. These are very simple, straightforward. You know what you're getting these places. So that was the biscuit up in Holland, Michigan. Is that right, Carly? That's right. All right, Billy. I know you're you were shortening your list. And I was laughing. It. I was <laughs> laughing because I was looking out for my wife because this is you almost got me in trouble. Man, this is McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the egg cheese McGriddle, baby. I have on my okay. I'm getting there and getting out. All right. All right. I'm with you. And I, and everyone knows here, hopefully, that McDonald's does make the absolute best French fries in all the land. But uh, I'm going to throw in there uh, Waffle House. I've been, Waffle House has been inseparable from my journey. Patty melt plate on, on wheat, save a couple calories, not Texas toast. That's been a go to for decades for me. So, all right, now that we've made everybody hungry, and Michelle, hey, EJ's in Naples, Florida. Excellent, wonderful. And hey, Michael 
and Jared. Great to see y'all. Let us know about your favorite breakfast joint uh, here in the ATL. We'd love to uh, love to share that with everybody. Um, all right. So Chris, Carly, and Billy, we got a lot of good stuff to get to here today. I, we're going to start with offering up some context. So let's start with you, Chris. Tell us a little bit about Blue Grace uh, Logistics and some of your background, Chris. Yeah, of course. So uh, Blue Grace is a non-asset based third party logistics provider. Uh, we really focus on North American over the road transportation. Uh, and our aim with our, our clients is to really help solve business issues with some kind of transportation solution. They're all a little unique and, and customized, but typically we're trying to find ways to leverage technology for planning, you know, automating manual processes, and really to help capture accurate data for our customers and, and help them drive their transportation strategy. And I'm on the business development side for our managed channel. Um, been with the company for 13 years. So I've got to see Blue Grace grow and change and evolve over time and, and maintain its flexibility. When you're building custom solutions, it's nice to have an organization and a leadership group that is always open to kind of unique solutions. And it's been a, it's been a fun ride going on year 13 now. Man. So, Chris, over those 13 years, have you won your fair share of the uh, NCAA bracket busters at Blue Grace? Uh, I usually do good the first two days of the first weekend, and then I always get crushed week two. So, <laughs> Well, hey, I love uh, all the growth. And we're going to touch on this later. Man, Blue Grace has been on the move for those 13 years and then some. Uh, Carly, tell us about yourself, if you would. Yeah, so I'm a little bit more... Uh, newer to the Blue Grace organization, came here about a year ago, but I'm not new at all to the industry. Um, started in logistics about 15 years ago in the freight forwarding side, did international freight, everything from customer uh, customs brokerage um, and customer account management, um, and then moved over to the domestic side where I really launched a career specifically in the LTL industry. So um, here at Blue Grace, I oversee carrier relations and procurement, but primarily focused on the LTL side. Oh, I love that. What a great collection, Billy. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, the company itself, but also Chris's and Carly's background. I think we're, we're teed up for a great conversation, huh? Absolutely. And their leadership perspective. Not only about you're going to hear about tools and processes, but you're also going to hear about superb leadership. And that's what right. I'm excited to, to for the audience to grasp. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Hey, uh, let's see. Michael, we're going back to breakfast, folks, says Papa's Papa's. All right, all right. So, Michael, you're going to have to let us know where that is. I'm assuming it's not your father uh, that he might can make cook a mean breakfast. Who knows? But let us know where that is. Hey, Sophia Rivas Herrera. Great to see you here today. The one and only. And Jared comes in with a 441 South barbecue down the road in Canton, Georgia. Only breakfast on Friday mornings. It's the go-to spot. All right, Jared, we're going to have to check that out now that we're starving. All right, so we got Chris and Carly's background. We know a little bit more about what Blue Grace is doing. I want to get into uh, our first topic here today, and we're talking data. It's, you know, As we all know, it's the lifeblood, at least one of them, one of the biggest ones of any organization, uh, and it's fueling global supply chains around the world, of course. So, Chris, Let's start with what are some effective systems and tools for capturing and analyzing supply chain data? Yeah, every organization is a little different. So we always like to take the approach of understanding what technology or tools the business is leveraging to run it, right? So you're looking at ERP systems, warehouse management systems, uh, Excel for some of the smaller mid-sized shippers, right? Um, and the goal usually from the transportation perspective is how do you close a loop on your data, right? So, you know, whether it's, looking at the the order level information or the sales information on that PO and trying to tie it back to transportation is really challenging for, for a lot of shippers. So the, the tools I always recommend are, are some sort of TMS or transportation management system. Yeah. Now, it'd be lovely if it's integrated, right? Because when you create manual processes, even with a, a great TMS, you run the risk of lack of compliance. You run the risk of, you know, you know a fat finger or a number or something. And so integration is key there just to kind of close the loop on the data. Uh, and then I always recommend some level of auditing, right? Whether you have a third party auditor, you got a great process internally, you got to make sure the data has some level of integrity and accuracy. And as a visual person, you know, business intelligence, in my opinion, is, is, is critical. You know, being able to visualize data, understand it a little better and, and also help tell the story, right? Internally, a lot of people in organizations don't have supply chain background. So by able to being able to use data, use the visualization of it, you really can you know can help start getting things done within the organization. 
Excellent starting point, Chris. I love that. And going back to your, one of your uh, second points there, integration. Billy, if we can if we can help it, let's not create hundreds and hundreds of new spreadsheets because, amongst other reasons, uh, you'd be surprised. A lot of studies out there, but per thousand touches, y'all be surprised. Maybe not Chris and Carly and Billy, but some of our audience might be surprised at just how many hundreds of errors there are per you know thousand manual touches. Billy, comment mm-hmm. there on what we heard from Chris. Well, Chris, really, I heard you describe really a connected business model, right? In the end. And then when you said audit, the first thing jumped in my mind was governance, right? If you don't have governance, then your systems will actually deviate from the standard. And so you have described a really unique connected business model and you hold to the standards through your auditing process. So that's what that's what I see in organizations that tend to fail. They have short lived successes, right? They get those those shiny pennies. Right. They don't have governance to hold the results. So, uh, you know, that was my key takeaway. And, and really, you're explaining how to win. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what's that's what's important. And systematize it and, and lock in those gains so you can build on top of them. Good stuff there. Um, Carly, let's shift over to you. Let's 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 move on to how shippers out there can identify opportunities within their data to gain some of these efficiencies and reduce costs. Carly, let's, let's start with your uh, carrier perspective first, maybe. Yeah, so like Chris said, the details are in the data, right? And when we work with our partners, the carriers, they're looking for that story that the data tells. So for our team and, you know, collaborating with uh, logistics partners like Blue Grace, we're able to help write that story for the carriers. So we break down the information into carrier lanes, um, average weights, freight classifications, that sort of thing, where we can actually tell a story about the big picture, you know, from a 40,000 foot view of what the business is doing and communicate that with our, with our partners of what they can anticipate the business to look like. Um, Fortunately or unfortunately for us, sometimes the data is not good, right? Uh, We don't love to have this beautiful, perfect data to send over. Um, But that's where players like Blue Grace can come in and really help clean up that data and help communicate that story to the partners to, to, you know, negotiate the pricing better. Love that. Uh, The story that data tells that just paints a picture. And Carla, to one of your last points, Hey, we gotta, we gotta, uh, we gotta keep it real. We gotta lean into the times when the data isn't pretty, right? We can't ignore it. We can't go bury our head in the sand. You know, that's not what leaders do. And I love also how you mentioned um, how blue grace can help tell that story, right? Tell us what the data paint that picture, what the data is sharing. Chris, let's let's shift over to your perspective, especially from that customer perspective. How what would be some of your thoughts there in terms of how shippers can identify opportunities? One of our main core values is to simplify. So let's let's simplify the approach. What are the things that drive cost in the transportation sector, right? It's weight, it's mileage, uh, it's maybe provider selection who I'm using. So I would focus on some of those you know simple areas. How can I increase order size? How can I uh, eliminate wasteful shipments or multiple shipments to the same consignee in a week, right? Look internally on your business model, where you're set up. Are you set up around your customers? I mean, how many times have you seen a business that is focused on the West Coast and 85% of their clients are east of the Mississippi? Right. Build your business around those customers and, and find ways to cut out mileage and reduce or increase weight on those orders and you'll find supply chain success. Love that, Chris. Mm-hmm. You know, Billy, a couple things are, I love Simplify, first off. Mm-hmm. I tell you, um, those leaders and those businesses, and those ecosystem partners that can truly find that powerful simplification operations, man, it's amazing how much a return that brings to the equation. And then the other thing, big point Chris made there, uh, Billy, is being able to step mm-hmm. back and stop doing business, how business has been done, and really reevaluate, hey, why are we doing this here? Why are we set up like this here? You know, those fresh eyes is so powerful, whether you're in mm-hmm. supply chain or elsewhere. Billy, your thoughts there? Well, a customer-centric approach, that's what first thing comes to mind when you're talking about you not only come up with the solutions, but you do change with your with your clients, not to your clients. And that's one thing I heard and I've read about that you've been recognized, and that's why you're one of the fastest-growing companies out there. But one of the things you talked about is the story, being transparent. Right. right? I often say you can't manage a secret. <laughs> you, you just can't. And so what you were describing is how do you expose those things that need to be addressed? And that's done with the customer. So that was my key takeaway, Scott. 
very well done. And, 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 and that's why you're being recognized that's uh, right. as one of the best. That is right. You can't manage the secret, Chris and Carly. Now, Billy, is that something you stole from your mother that we talk about a lot? Because I know that impact, <laughs> right? Well, what she told me about one of the things, once you know the story, right, you have to be willing to accept it, right? And one of the things I say, don't treat, don't, don't be afraid to call the baby ugly. That's all I'm going to say, right? <laughs> all not right, Carly. Be, not that it's an ugly baby. It's right. It's being transparent and being able to talk about things that are sensitive. Yeah, uh, I love that. It's like one of my favorite Seinfeld episodes. But Carly, it goes back to your point and what you and Chris both touched on, which, hey, every day the data is not going to be gorgeous telling some beautiful story. And, and it's how folks work together, both inside and outside the four walls on those tougher days when we're trying to wrangle, you know, get a clear indication of what's going on and and tell an accurate story so we could do something about it. Carly, quick, uh, quick comment on that before I keep moving. Yeah. So I always tell people, talk to the boots on the ground, right? We're talking about the people who see the freight daily, the terminal managers, the people who are operating the freight. There's so much that data does say, but also things it doesn't say. So, yep. you know, we think the freight looks perfect and then there's a cone on top, something that isn't captured in the data. And we can only get from actually seeing the freight and talking to the people who are handling and seeing that freight. Excellent points. Uh, all right. So, Carla, I'm coming back to you and Chris on our next uh, question here in just a second. I want to recognize a few folks. Hey, Stephanie tuned in, tuned in from Germany via LinkedIn. Great to see you, Stephanie. Let us know what you think. Uh, hey, Papa's is in Dawsonville, Georgia, mm -hmm. and I believe that's up north somewhere, Michael. Uh, but hey, great. We're going to check it out. And Sophia loves this point about uh, building the governance to hold results accountable is fundamental. Excellent point, Sophia. And I know Chris and Billy both were touching on uh, governance. Um, all right. So let's keep driving. I'm going to stick with you, Carly. So what when you think about uh, strategies or advice that can help businesses lower transportation costs, proven ideas that work in an up market, a down market, and all points in between, what would you suggest, Carly? Yeah, so this kind of goes back to what we were just talking about, right? Like identifying those root causes of what is generating cost in a network, cost not only for the carrier, but for, for the customer as well. So identifying those, um, fostering collaboration, not only with the logistics partners, but also those suppliers and distributors, you know, who is handling the freight on the front end and who's receiving it on the back end, understanding how that flow works. Um, and then sharing the data and communicating with all of those parties. So sometimes they don't understand the impact that they have on the network and what's driving that cost. When we talk to a carrier and they can break down, you know, what percentage of the cost is in the pickup, what percentage of the cost is in the delivery, and suddenly that is thrown out of proportion from what they typically see, that's a driving, driving the cost right there. So um, conversations that we can have both with the carrier and then all of the parties that are involved. I love that. And, you know, I think all too often to your point, Carly, and I know you've been doing this quite some time, 15 years in industry is we walk right past the people that can tell us what's really going on, right? We're on our way to this, this meeting or that meeting. Let's get down in, the, in, in these facilities and talk to the people that are moving freight, uh, every hour, right? That's such a great point, uh, Carly. Chris, what would you add to this uh, as we're trying to find efficiencies and lower these costs, regardless of the market we're in, what would you add? Probably something all of our moms taught us, which is you shouldn't throw stones if you live in a glass house. <laughs> Love look, that one. Look internally first. I mean, I, I would challenge most executives to kind of walk through an order to cash cycle and see the kind of wasted steps or processes they have at the transportation level. It's typically the most underfunded, under-resourced department in the organization, and it's always a top five expense on a PL. So if you look internally, I, I would again challenge people to say, do I have the right tools, technologies, resources for my people to be successful? Because you can build all the strategies you want. If you don't have the right tools, resources to execute it, it's going to be wasted. Excellent point, Chris. Excellent point. All right. So Billy. We heard a lot of good stuff Been there, done that good stuff from Carly and Chris. Uh, what stood out to you? Well, I thought first I heard al alignment, right? Get an alignment, not only with your customer, but with your people. And then once you get alignment, ownership, right? Who owns what, right? Because often, and one of my favorite quotes is, in the absence of ownership comes blame. 
And last, what I really heard out of this here conversation that was outstanding to myself was as, as y'all both were breaking the strategy down, separating who works in the business that's closest to the source and who should be working on the business. Mm. And yeah. so when you can get th that alignment and that clarity, now the strategy is built in the room, right? Chris, you and Carly are a big part of the strategy. But then what's the big part of producing the goods and doing the job? Those are the people that work in the business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you connect those two? And that's when you become Nick Saban, right? Uh, of, of supply chain. That's when you become the, the consistent winner. Scott, I know you're a uh, big Georgia fan. But Nick Saban <laughs> has been doing it that well for a long time because of those things, alignment and ownership. That's right. All right. So close, a uh, big Clemson fan. And we've, okay. Hey, we faced down Nick Saban plenty of times. I tell you, he just kept, kept winning and winning. But to your point, to the analogy, Billy, I love that, you know, we're, we're collecting, you know, in, in college football is trophies uh, in global supply chain it's delighted customers. Mm -hmm. And in all of our conversations with Carly and Chris and their colleagues, I know that's a big way they measure um, how they're doing as well. Um, all right. So I want to switch over to change management because goodness gracious, if we're, if we're have doubled down or tripled down in anything these days, it is how to manage and uh, how to implement change, but then manage it mm -hmm. with uh, this ever evolving supply chain landscape we're in these days. So Chris, I'll start with you here. How do you measure the impact of changes implemented in your supply chain strategy? The first thing is starting with a baseline. I think Billy Ray said earlier, what's the standard? You, you have to set a standard. Uh, if you don't have a standard, you don't have anything to measure against. And if we're implementing change uh, with no measurable goals, what's the outcome? Yep. Right. So being able to set that baseline and really understand the underlying drivers of that baseline uh, is, is really important. And then I'm a big proponent when you're managing change, you, you got to have all the voices in the room. Uh, where where a lot of these programs go to fail is when it's pushed down from the top and you're not talking to the people on the dock. You're not talking to the people who are making the supply chain decisions every day. So when you get different perspectives and different voices in the room about transportation, you, you build a really good strategy. And, and I'll end it with one last thing on this is, is we really focus on four pillars of the organization. Okay. The users, the technical aspect, the financial aspect, and the executives. You get those four voices in a room to build a program, you'll come out with something special and measurable at the end of the day. Love that, Chris. And yeah, you, we got to establish a baseline so we can we can have this valuable context and kind of know where we are. You know, we, a lot of times we know where we want to go, but we don't know where we are to start with. Um, all right. So, Carly, uh, let's talk about the importance of collaboration. You touched on this earlier, and we, I think we touched on it a couple of times. Chris, you kind of alluded to it uh, as well, when you're talking about bringing in all the right voices into the room, I love that uh, phraseology. So, Carly, the importance of collaboration and building a plan for change that works, and how shippers can effectively collaborate, successfully collaborate with partners. Your thoughts, Carly? Yeah, that's a big thing, right? Getting all of the key stakeholders in the room, everybody that's involved in the business. Um, you know, naturally, a lot of people are resistant to change. So identifying where that resistance is going to be and addressing that from the beginning. Um, but then not only explaining the plan, but also the benefits of the plan for change and then creating uh, actionable steps for that change and then measuring that along the way. So um, there are things that we have done where, you know, again, communication is key. Everybody's yep. communicating, everybody that's involved, and then making sure that that communication is regular. I always say this isn't something we should be having a conversation about once a quarter or once every year when rate renewals are coming up. But we talk about what's happening in the business regularly so that no one's blindsided a year later when something is is changing. Right. No one wins with surprises, right? Unless maybe you right. uh, you have the winning lottery ticket and that's the surprise <laughs> maybe of a lifetime, right? Um, a quick follow-up question. You kind of touched on this, but I want to dig, dig just a little bit deeper. And I love your comment about consistent communication. Don't just talk when there's a new project or don't just talk when it's renewal time or don't just talk when uh, there's a big problem. Consistent communication throughout the year. I love that. So, when you think of how these relationships, suppliers, carriers, other stakeholders, the whole ecosystem, right? How you can leverage that to truly implement 
change and make it happen so you can build on it from there. Any quick thoughts there, Carly? Yeah, well, any change requires planning, coordinating, and adaptability, right? So it's good, again, to have all the stakeholders involved and then um, that communication of the progress, but also the feedback of when it, it does and doesn't work and kind of closing that loop and reevaluating where everybody is. Right. So your um, constant reevaluation, constant yes. putting their finger on the pulse, yes. never set it and forget it. Right. right. Never said yep. it and forget it. Right. Um, Cause change happens and, and, and change beyond Billy. I'm bringing you in here uh, for a comment on what Carly is sharing here. Um, change happens to the organization, even when we're trying to drive change within the organization. Right. We don't get to control at all. Billy, your thoughts about driving change. Well, it's change. The only constant of what we do. All right. It's, 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 it's going to happen, but there's two things as I, as I listened to Carly, when she was talking about, being consistent. And I thought a deliberate clarity, right? Because communication is the core of any relationship, whether yep. you're at home or at work. And that's the essence of building trust. Why would I follow you? Why would I buy into what you're doing? But if you're communicating with me, I can get that type of buy-in, that type of trust. Yep. And it goes back to Chris, when you said standard, again, one of my mom's favorite sayings: what you accept, you cannot change. So Love what that. you accept, that it's not what you write down. That's not the standard. It's what you walk by mm. and do nothing about. That's the standard. So when you look at those two things married together, that is change management. Yep. Setting the standard and communicating it to everyone. Yeah. I love your earlier comments as well around clarity and trust. You know, you know, um, if you can build trust with the team and communicate very clearly so that they're, you know, answer every question, man, that's when we can take the velocity of change that that's successful from zero to 60 really quickly. Right. Um, all right. Uh, Billy, one quick follow up your mother's name. I don't, I, I need, I need to start using her name rather than just say Billy's mom. What's your mother's name? Vera. Vera. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, Vera. All right. Good stuff. Uh, all right. So Chris, we got a bunch of comments here. I'm going to try to bring in here in just a second, but Chris, I'm going to get to you when it comes to change, change and more change. Some of the common challenges in anticipating and managing the impacts of change in supply chain operations. How can those be addressed? Break down the silos. I mean, the biggest issue we see with organizations, they don't, they don't communicate. Um, sales doesn't communicate the reasons why they, they want certain things. Production is not communicating issues or errors that are happening. Um, and, and it all kind of falls on, on transportation. So when we're talking about change, it's important to understand the perspectives of everybody that's involved in it and the impact transportation has on, on their you know, channel in the organization. And really, really understand why are certain decisions being made. Um, and you know the, the old adage is we hear a lot, this is how it's always been done. Right. You know, you got to have some 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 hard conversations, calling the baby ugly to Billy's point. Mm -hmm. But but getting those voices in the room, I think, is the biggest thing. Um, for instance, when we do implementations, you're, you're getting multiple stakeholders involved and you learn a lot about kind of some of the things that have been swept under the rug in an organization over time. And the more and more those organizations can knock down barriers, knock down walls and communicate th those programs just become you know more more valuable and beneficial to, to everybody. Yes. Well said. Oh, to be a fly on the wall, Chris and Carly, as you are implementing and all those skeletons in the closet are coming out. Uh, I bet you have to write a book uh, later. I'll be the first one to buy it. A um, couple of quick comments here from our audience. So, uh, hey, Tony, great to see you from Michigan. Michigan is a theme of today's show for sure. Let's see here. Um, Rob, the one and only Rob Haddock is with us. Rob, great to see you. He's uh, down here in ATL. As a shipper for life, although retired, I love the conversation the group is having. I do too. I tell you, Chris and Carly and Billy, uh, it's like a, a one-two punch plus a bonus upper hook, uh, <laughs> uppercut, I mean, Billy. Yeah. Uh, Tyrone, break the silos and let the infl infl uh, information flow i bet was the last word he was going to use there and hey brian birdsong from uh, atlanta great to see you here via uh linkedin okay so up next well billy i'll give you a chance we're you know chris just shared a lot especially one of our favorite things breaking silos Your i love talks. it so chris what you said with silos i work with companies all over the world 
uh, and leaders all over the world. And you think about silos and one, one thing, the word is managing the intersections. When you have silos, you, those are managing collisions. When you have, when you break those out and people know their roles and their lanes, those are now functions and tiers that are connections and those are easy to manage. Yeah. And so, I, I, I mean, that's a great point, breaking down those silos and, 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 and right, building those, those aligned organizations. So there's, the silos are now connections, not collisions. Yes. So very good point. Excellent point. And gosh, we keep Carly and Chris and Billy, we've known for generations the damage that silos can have within organizations, but yet we keep building them, right? <laughs> We're busting them with one hand and building them with the other. I'll tell you what. Um, all right. So let's keep driving. We'll get into a few examples. You know, we've touched on a lot of things in the past 31 minutes. And Carly and Chris, I know y'all have no shortage based on all the work y'all do, implementations and the relationships y'all have, no shortage of examples. Carly, let's start with you. Uh, any uh, case study, success story comes to mind for organizations out there that truly have simplified that supply chain and managed this chain we're talking, change we're talking about very effectively. Yeah. So uh, recently we actually had a customer that continued to see some increases in their pricing and just didn't fully understand the why and what was happening behind the scenes. So we facilitated kind of a roundtable discussion with not only the customer, but also with the carriers in the room. Um, we just broke down what they were doing, you know, from beginning to end. And what we found is that there was a lot of cost on their pickup side with their vendors. And, you know, the vendors don't necessarily know what they're doing drives the cost. So they did a lot of vendor management um, and made some changes. Again, they identified what was going on. They created a plan around it. They communicated not only what they were doing, but the outcome. And then about a month later, we sat down with the carriers again and said, do you see your cost improving in the network now that these changes have been made? And they did. So that was a great way for us to really dig into what the root cause was of what was driving this cost, what was driving a poor OR for the carriers on their side. And then again, have the customer actually work with their vendor. So it was a lot of parties involved, um, large collaboration effort. Um, again, spoke with the boots on the ground, you know, what does the freight look like? That was something that was really eye-opening is that we found out there were vendors where the freight looked very different than what we thought it was looking like because it was looking different when it was delivered. Um, and so all of those things, again, a, a round table collaboration of all of the parties involved. Yes. Love that. And it, well, what you shared early in your response, getting the root cause, right? We got to, we got to uh, stop at surface level and stop using band-aids and band-aids. We got to fix these problems so they don't come up again so we can truly move on. Right, Carly? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep. All right. So Chris, as we think of anecdotes, stories, experiences where organizations, again, are really good at simplifying and, and managing, implementing change and moving on and building, I'd, I'd call it. What comes to mind for you, Chris? We had a client that had uh, 10 facilities, distribution centers that they were uh, leveraging to support their, their customer network. Um, and we started to look at what we call DC optimization. You know, are we shipping from the right location? And what we started to see was this pattern where, you know, kind of looks like your, your three or four year olds crayon drawing on the US, there's <laughs> lines going everywhere with <laughs> right. no real rhyme or reason. Um, and you ask some simple questions like, hey, you know, is it an inventory issue? Well, no, you have all the same inventory in, the, in, in each location. Um, so why does this happen? And it turned out to a very simple thing is they didn't have the ability to allocate freight expense to a sales rep. So they allocated to the facility the rep was assigned to. Mm. So when you start to look at it, you go, okay, if we threw that out, how would your network look? And you look at the mileage reduction, the, the speed to delivery, the increased service by using more regional carriers where, where it's effective. And you actually improve your customer's experience simply by finding another way to allocate freight expense rather than just to a DC. Well, great. Capture a sales, a sales rep code, cap, capture a DC code, rethink your, your method of allocating freight expense. And they ended up cutting out like two and a half million dollars of transfer cost. Wow. Just transferring freight in between facilities. They had a massive impact on their carbon emissions. They cut their service days down from average of 3.6 to 1.7 and saved about $400,000 on the outbound expense as well. 
all 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 we had to do is unlock the why. Why are you doing things this way? And it's a very simple uh, issue of just reallocating freight expense the right way. Chris, I love I love both of y'all's examples, and I'm sure we could be here all day with others. Billy, I tell you. $3 million, almost what Chris talks about. That is a dog that hunts in anyone's book, I believe. <laughs> and one other thing that really stood out in Chris's example, uh, he's talking about asking why. You know, you and I both are familiar with the five why approach, right? Mm -hmm. Don't stop. And, and Carly and Chris look like they are too. Don't stop with the first mm -hmm. answer why. Keep driving. That's one of the ways that, that helps right. us get to root cause. But Billy, what did right. you hear there from Carly and Chris's examples? Well, customer back approach. All right. And starting with the customer, defining what winning is at the customer perspective, and then looking at the waste flowing all the way back to through the supply chain. All right. And and and, and look, it's it could go as far as paying to merge for storing product on trucks. And right. those right, those are just waste. That's just money you're spending and and streamlining the organization so that you can see the waste. Yeah. And so and then you can now you know what to go target to improve. And that's where those five whys really come in hand. Why is yeah. that there? Why is this happening? And if you can't explain it, it's a secret, right? <laughs> that's right. Secrets can't be managed. You can't be managing. So y'all are great, very good at walking it all the way back from the customer perspective. And that's the end game. And so, Scott, that's what I heard. Yep. Walking that whole system back, giving visibility to it so you know what to attack. Yeah. Well said. Uh, learning to see waste. Carly, Chris, and Billy. That is so it can be really challenging for a variety of folks, especially mm -hmm. if you've been doing things the same way for a long time. Absolutely. And what uh, Carly and Chris and Billy, you kind of touched on this too. And Chris, you really did because you were talking about four year olds, you know, drawing outside the lines. Sometimes it's really important, although sometimes we can't change everything we would like in any given day or week or month. But starting with a blank piece of paper. And, and really reimagining the business and, and how we address certain customers or run certain uh, certain aspects of our operations. I bet, based on some of the results that both of y'all were sharing here, that was part of the solution, thinking a lot differently about I, the business. I have to pause. It's kind of when we were in the green room. I, Carly and Chris, where were you at years ago when I was running operations as a young leader? Right when I was like, and we talked about it when I was running, I just wanted numbers. And Scott said it. I made tires and what round and black and out the back. I wasn't worried about the supply chain. <laughs> I was just filling up those trailers, and so that was wrong. We should have been making what the customer <laughs> ordered. And so you broke it down pretty precise. And I'm thinking, where are they at when I was the the young leader coming up? So that's it, Scott. They they you know that's the power I think of simplification where everyone knows exactly what the mission is in any given part of the day. And at the end of that day, when folks can answer the question confidently, if they had a good day or in some cases they had a bad day and Carly and Chris, a lot of what you are talking about here today from the communication and, and getting, um, getting very real with the data and what the story is to uh, knocking out silos, uh, building trust within organizations. I mean, that's when, and, and to what y'all both have touched on, bringing all the voices into the room and, and making sure they're heard and they can weigh in with their incredible knowledge and expertise. You know, oftentimes, you know, we talk about going to the Gimba, right? Where that value is created. It's so, so powerful. And Carly and Chris, I love how that's one of y'all's big themes in y'all's approach. Um, all right. Couple comments here from the audience here. Malenga says, Hey, love the reminder on the five whys, especially when you want to manage waste. Excellent call out there. Great to have you here today. Charles says, putting the customer in the center of the conversation, love it, helps drive relevant solutions and finding that root cause. Absolutely brilliant. Hey, Chris and Carly, that's high praise from Charles Robertson. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Hey, Chris, welcome in from Cincinnati. Love the energy. I love the energy, but I love the the can do. I mean, you know, Chris and Carly and Billy uh, speaking from what they're doing out there in the industry. I love that. Uh, and I had one more comment I wanted to reference here a second ago. Uh, all right. Malenga also says this. Uh, no animal farm kind of leadership is required in this. Do y'all remember reading Animal Farm back in the day? Chris and Carly and Billy. It's one of my favorite children's stories. Y'all no, <laughs> no. I was gonna say I'm gonna have to, uh, I'm gonna have to go to my daughter's bookshelf and try. All to right, <laughs> so go check it out. But 
what Malenga is kind of referencing is how an animal farm um, uh, leaders start creating different rules for different people. Right. And that can evaporate trust when you got one class here and the next class here, man, it is a culture killer. So Malenga, great, great call out there. Um, okay. Billy, uh, you're nodding your hand. Culture, I know, is 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 what you get jump out of bed thinking about, what you uh, go to bed at night thinking about. Quick mm -hmm. comment there about the power of culture. The culture sets the pace, right? It's the pacemaker, right? It's it's what you accept. It's how your standards come to life, your way of living, right? It's no different than when I come home when I'm on, on the road. There's a standard in our house. Yeah. My kids follow it. I follow it, right? Now my yeah. wife sets the standard. <laughs> <laughs> and the, we follow no in all seriousness the culture is established at the top and you talk about those standards what other people get away with yeah well leaders control that standard once you set the standards you build culture off holding people to those standards yeah that's where the culture is and then the last but not least but don't ever discount the value proposition yeah that's what people want more than anything when leaders can let people know that they're valued then that's where the culture starts to be established Excellent point. And that kind of goes back to what Carly and Chris were talking about, bringing everybody into the table. And then Carly, you're talking about those ecosystems uh, and, and leveraging them. Well, standard creating those standards throughout, right? right. Whether we're talking about uh, service level agreements or other different ways that we establish standards within our relationships and, and uh, supplier relationships, you name it. Um, all right. So Carly and Chris, we've got a couple of resources we're going to share with folks in just a minute. But, you know, <clears throat> as you are out and about moving mountains out there in global supply chain, uh, I want to make sure folks know how to connect with both of y'all. So, Carly, I'm going to start with you. If folks want to talk shop with you, uh, if they want to maybe bring you in, have you speak uh, at their organization or maybe even find a better way for doing business. How can folks connect with you, Carly Block? Sure, so you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm available there. And then also, if you're in the industry and you're familiar with the SMC conference, I will be at SMC3 um, in Colorado in June. Outstanding. That is a great, uh, great venue, great organization. And y'all can connect with Carly over maybe a delicious Colorado microbrew. Uh, Carly, how's that sound? Sounds good. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris, that's going to be tough to beat, man. She's painting that picture. Uh, beautiful conference out in Colorado. So, Chris, how can folks connect with you? Well, I wish I could meet everybody at the microbrewery as well, but uh, <laughs> follow me on LinkedIn. We'd love to connect with you there. Um, we were just at Modex, so we do a lot of, obviously, trade shows and things like that. So as we, as our great marketing team kind of gets us into a lot more of those things, we'll keep publishing on LinkedIn and you know, always, always available for conversations like this. So, again, I appreciate you guys' time today. Oh, you bet. I love y'all's approach. Uh, I really do. Really enjoyed our uh, pre-show conversations in the whole last hour. Uh, so folks, hey, connect with both Chris and Carly, whether it's at a conference or on LinkedIn, you name it. And we've got some resources I'm going to share in just a minute. Hey, Billy, heads up. I'm coming to get your favorite takeaway you heard here today after I share these resources and a couple more comments here from our audience. Uh, Nadim says, leaders, Lead to standards, not operations. That's an interesting phrase, Nadine. Great to have you back here with us today. Uh, Naleli says, I love when people can actually, uh, with data, answer if they had a good day or bad day We're using data, visual mm -hmm. controls as well. That's a great call out there. Mm -hmm. There's so many visual learners out there, um, and that's really important. And, and really to the core, what she was saying there, to be, for folks, again, to confidently know when they've had a really good day or if it's been a challenging day, you know, that, that helps guide what they do the next day. Right. So great call out there. Okay. So Chris, you were talking about drawing and four year olds. Well, we've got something here that I love what your team came up with. And I've got a visual here. How about this folks? Logistics powers unleashed. Now I came across this at Modex right? As I walked past your y'all's um, great booth and met some of your team members, this caught my eye. This was genius stuff, right? Genius stuff on a variety of levels. I think it's fun for industry professionals to use and folks, y'all can use this link we're dropping. You can download uh, your own comic book and let us know what you think. But 
Chris and Carly and Billy. As a father of three kids who I've been trying to introduce supply chain to since you know we brought them home from the hospital, this is really cool. So kudos to you and the team. Can I put you on the spot? Who, who what idea started this? Any anyone y'all can give credit yeah. to? Or what, who That's came up with saying. it? Yeah, well, uh, Mark Mark Dirks and Adam White, who run our marketing team, um, started out with a blueprint for managed logistics, and we were working on all these things like, how do you build a foundation for a managed program? And the next year, they had this great idea to talk about like, what are some of the villains in supply chain? Oh, you know, uh, and you know the Excel sorcerer, the the invisible data man. Yes, um, Mr. Manual Process, all these things that kind of like are these little uh, issues with transportation and they made it to these great characters, built a great story. And we had more people come up at Modex just to compliment our booth and our marketing. Um, and they just do such a tremendous job being different in the space and really highlighting kind of how Blue Grace sets, sets the standard in the industry for managed transportation and, and marketing, obviously. Chris, I love it. And you, you, you mentioned some of these villains, uh, Chris. And what my favorite, I think, was the one you mentioned, spreadsheet sorcerer <laughs> in a realm where knowledge was power. Uh, and I could go ahead and read it, but I, they, they've got all four villains on like the, 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 the second page. And, you know, Chris and Carly, I, I think it's brilliant because not only can practitioners and professionals kind of have fun while identifying some core challenges that pop up in any organization, but, you know, pass this out to the kids. They're going to be figuring out what logistics is and, and how to get into the industry. So y'all keep it coming. And to our listeners out there, again, uh, we're dropping a link. We already did. You can download your own uh, version of that comic book and let us know which villain is your favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, a little bit more serious, a little more buttoned down. We got to have that stuff too. Hey, y'all check out this uh, white paper here from the Blue Grace team that touches on the immense benefits of a managed transportation program. Some of what you heard both from Chris and especially Carly earlier today. So we're going to drop the link to that as well. We've heard a lot of feedback around that too. Um, all right. So Carly, I'm going to put you on the spot. Is your favorite, the white paper or the comic book? I know what mine is. No offense to the people, the great people that did the white paper, but the comic yeah. book takes home the a Nick Saban trophy, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. I mean, I enjoy the white paper information, but entertainment purposes. I love the comic book. Hey, we got to make it fun. Got to make yeah. it fun while we move the business forward. And again, folks, we dropped a link to um, downloading your comic book there. So you're one click away, or you can check out the white paper as well. Both uh, are good stuff um, there. All right. So Billy, man, Chris and Carly has brought it today. Really have enjoyed our conversation. Had a bunch of great comments from across the um, across the uh, chat room here today. Chat room, it sounds so 90-ish. Uh, <laughs> the, the comment section, I'll say that. <laughs> so, all right, so Billy, your favorite part. Chris mm -hmm. and Carly brought a lot here, so it might be tough to narrow it down, but what's your favorite takeaway here today? Well, I got it. When I sit there, and then I'm going to ask Carly and, and both to, to, to come in afterwards and add to. One I took away was that how we win. You clearly outlined how we win blue grace and it starts with strategy and you talked about your transportation management system once you built a strategy you did that with all the voices in the room mm. and you brought the key stakeholders in the room and being specific you align that strategy with the user technicians the financials and the executives so it wasn't just a top-down approach right you did a connected and aligned approach and last but not least communication 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 you made sure that that strategy wasn't a secret. You made sure the key stakeholders knew what the strategy was and what they owned in the strategy. Mm. And last but not least, as I look at your pictures, what jumped off the TV for me, the screen for me, was the speed of trust. In a short period of time, you got Scott and I roped in. We bought in. You could see our smiles. And so that you can't buy. So with that, that's how you win. So that's my summary of what you do very well. Beautiful. Uh, and, and they brought comic books that <laughs> always wins. Uh, as yeah. Jared mentions, I think I picked up the comic book at Modex as well. It was well done, Jared. Excellent call out. I think a lot mm -hmm. of folks, I saw articles written from Modex from y'all's idea here. But kidding aside, my favorite part probably, because I'm, I'm a big, as, as Amanda and Catherine, who's behind the scenes, thanks to you both what you do, can attest. I'm big. I'm a very practical thinker. 
And Chris, that close to $3 million that y'all unlocked in that example that you shared, man, imagine what they were able to do with those savings and, and create a better organization, faster growth, the opportunities for their team members. I mean, when you unlock those types, uh, that logistics power unleashed, I mean, that's the real deal, Holyfield. So a lot of good stuff there. So folks, make sure you connect with Chris and Carly. Learn a lot more. Uh, don't take it from us. Ask the questions. Uh, they will be able to answer them, I can assure you. So big thanks, Chris Capillas, Vice President of Sales, Managed Logistics with Blue Grace. Thanks for being here, Chris. Great. Scott, I got to see it. Oh, yeah. Please. yeah. I'm thinking of mom, right? And she would say in her southern tone, Billy, them folks know what they're doing. <laughs> Vera. 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 <laughs> Makes an appearance. Number 992 here on Supply Chain Now. Love it, Billy. Uh, Chris, uh, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. And, and Billy, that trust piece is huge for us. There is a great book called Getting Naked by Patrick Lencioni. That is what we modeled our sales strategy off of. And it's having tough conversations, being honest with customers. So you hit the nail on the head there. Love that. And I'm not going to reference the Louis Grizzard uh, mm -hmm. book talking about... Uh, is it naked or naked? Because there's two different <laughs> definitions, as, as Louis Grizzard once said. But Chris, love that. Getting Naked by Patrick um, Lencioni. Lencioni, that's right. Uh, good stuff here. Thanks for being here, Chris. And Carly Bly, Senior Director of Carrier Relations with Blue Grace, uh, a not-so-secret weapon part of the Blue Grace team. Appreciate what you do and your background. So uh, thanks for being here today, Carly. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And like you said, we we really build trust through being, you know, direct, transparent, and overall kind. So we love the organization that I work with. Proud to be here to represent them. And thanks for having us today. Love that. And and I love how she wrapped, uh, mentioned kindness, you know, kindness. As I share with my kids, PTK every day, patience, tolerance, and kindness. And that's a big part of uh of doing business right in my book at least um well as tony hayes says here great discussion thank you scott billy carly and chris yes tony thanks for being here and i think it was a great discussion so big thanks to chris and carly and billy big thanks to Catherine and amanda behind the scenes thanks to all the folks that showed up i know we couldn't hit everybody's comments but uh hopefully it'll fuel some post event conversations so we shall see as tyrone says the best leaders stay learners well said here today. Learn something new every single day. But folks, the onus now is on you. We've heard some good stuff here from Chris and Carly and Billy, but you got to take at least one thing, just one thing, and put it into action. Make it easier for your teams to get stuff done and get stuff done more profitably. That's what Chris and Carly and the Blue Grace team do. So with that said, on behalf of the entire team here at Supply Chain Now, Scott Luton challenging you do good, give forward, be the change that's needed. And we'll see you next time right back here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.